Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 27. Thank you for being here. Before I get into the episode, I'd like to remind you that if you enjoy the podcast and you'd like to offer support for the project, you can go to patreon.com forward slash journaling with nature. Thank you to all the patrons who've pledged their support. It really does help make this project sustainable so that journaling with nature can continue to connect nature journalers from across the globe. I'm very excited to share this episode with you. Today, my guest is Isaiah Scott. Isaiah is an incredibly inspirational young person who has achieved so much even before he graduated from high school. In our interview, we talk about his passion for birding, wildlife photography, and nature art. You're going to learn what nature looks like in the low country, Isaiah's beginning as a birding guide, as well as his research into the historical interactions between birds and people in the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. The Gullah Geechee history and culture is something that I knew little about before I met Isaiah, and I encourage you to follow the links in the show notes for this episode to learn more about Gullah Geechee culture, language, art, cuisine, and music. So now let's listen to my chat with Isaiah. Okay, let's start. Thank you so much for being with me. I'm excited to chat to you. Yes, thank you so much for having me and reaching out. And I'm I'm really excited to this is my first podcast. So oh, fantastic. I'm really excited. Really excited. <laughs> <laughs> I I usually start my podcast by asking my guests about their childhood nature experiences. Have you always had a connection with nature? Was nature part of your childhood? Um it definitely was. Uh, growing up, I loved spending time outside, being in my backyard, and I remember one of my first memories of like connecting to nature and like animals was reading books mm. in my elementary school library. I loved to le- read dinosaur books and books on prehistoric animals, and I loved the ocean and like reptiles and amphibians and so I, I definitely had a connection with nature growing up and uh, just over the years have evolved into my interest with birds. Yes. And so, yes. Tell me about that. Tell me about how your interest and passion for birding started. Um, it actually started three years ago. And this was when uh, my brother, his name is Darius, he... Uh, we all went on a college visit with him to Cornell University. Mm -hmm. And I remember like we flew in and um, it's like this small little airport. It had like two terminals on it. And because this was like, like not almost in the middle of nowhere, but this was like upstate New York. So it wasn't like, you know, very bustling like city New York. And it was like in the mountains. But anyways, in the airport li- in the lobby area, they had like these the brochure stands of like place to visit. And then I saw one for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And so I picked it up. I was like, oh wow, this seems like a like a really interesting place to visit uh while we're up here. And it's a part of the campus of Cornell. So um I remember it was the next day we took a visit. And we just walked into this huge facility that's in the middle of uh, this nature preserve called Sap Suffolk Woods. And they have this big glass wall, like that overlooks like the lake and the wetlands and the forest. And we can see like Canada geese and like green herons. And there was red winged blackbirds, but what really like something that really captivated me while I was there was there was this big mural of birds from all over the world. It was a big map. And I just, I just thought that was like the, 
one of the best things I've ever seen. It was so mm. beautiful. And it just showed the the array and like diversity of birds around the world. That really just that just intrigued me to to go out and and bird watch. And yeah. and that's that visiting the Cornell Lab Ornithology, it has it just sparked my interest in birds a lot. That's a fantastic story. What um, it's like, that's not what you went there for. You went there for your brothers um, to check out the university, but then this yeah. thing that's just taken you on a whole new path in your life. That's amazing. Yes, it was very unexpected. Yeah, I just didn't know that I'll just leave from that college visit with binoculars in my hand, hunting yeah. down birds like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so cool. So you went home and then you just started doing this in your local neighborhood? Yes. Um, I just came back home and I started bird watching my backyard and I just found like a whole bunch of like 15 species in my backyard mm. one day. There was like yellow bellied sap suckers, which and birds that I've never like seen before or knew about that existed in my backyard in my neighborhood. And there's like pillared woodpeckers would come in my backyard, um, yellow rump warblers, uh, brown thrashers. There's like a, a pair of brown thrashers that come in and I'll still see them today. Cedar wax wings and I'll just, just a whole new world that um, after I started bird watching. Yeah, it's so cool that all this stuff was in your backyard all the time and it wasn't until you tuned in that you realised all this wonders right there that you just yes. um, focus on, you know, that suddenly the world has opened. Yes, definitely. I, I've noticed that you um, post pictures of yourself birding on the shore. Is is the beach somewhere you love to go birding? The beach is... My favorite place in the world. Okay. <laughs> um, I I just love the beach. I just I have a connection. I just have some connection to the ocean. I feel it. Mm. Like whenever I go to the yeah. beach and just walk on like the soft sand and have the Atlantic meet me at my feet. And I've been going there as a child as well. And I forgot to mention that growing up, I would go to the beach. Mm. And um, so, yes. Um, the beach I love going to the beach and after birding that really just like like deepened my connection yeah. with the ocean um you know spotting and sighting shorebirds and giant pelicans flying over the waves and all the migratory terns and the goals and uh that really just just furthered my connection to o ocean just to be able to to just enjoy the, the ocean birds and mm. uh yes and tell me about art so you are a bird artist as well and i'd love to know about art did art come before birding for you or is it something that you got into to deepen your birding experience so art was i've been doing art and drawing and painting ever since I was little. And so this was something like definitely I was doing before getting into birding. Um, I'm, I was self-taught. Um, I, the only, I had art classes throughout elementary school, but that was just a time for me to really practice and use my skills and just sharpen my skills. Um, I didn't really like the teacher didn't really like teach me anything I was just just doing it yeah and I would draw doodle in my free time and just do like little art projects painting projects and then it wasn't until like after I got uh found my passion for birding that I started doing bird paintings and drawings and I remember when my first like really good drawings or artwork of a bird was I did this pencil color pencil drawing of a wood duck and uh, my teacher I remember I was in class one day and uh, 
I was just like, just trying to figure out something to draw. And I asked my teacher, I was like, oh, what's something I should draw? Like, do you have any ideas or like something that I could just draw? And then he said, oh, you should draw a wood duck. And I was like, okay, I think I, I, think I can draw that. <laughs> so I just looked up some references on Google and started drawing with some uh, color pencils. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I showed it, to, showed it to him after like three to five days. And he was just, just blown away. He was yeah. just stunned. And, uh, and then I showed it to my, uh, my mom. And she was just like, like, I didn't know you can draw like this. How like, did you wow. do that? Yeah. <laughs> like, how did you, like, like my, like my parents, they knew that I was artistic and I could mm. draw, but like, they never seen anything. A deeper level. Like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so Wood Duck was the first yes. bird, um, bird drawing you did. And now you do so many. And um, I've seen you out there field sketching, you know, I guess sometimes you paint at home, but sometimes you're out there in the field with your sketchbook on your knees on the beach with the, the wind whipping past. I love these um, images of you field sketching. I think that's such a fun, um, a fun way to capture nature out yes. in the wild yes i love um i just had this i wanted like to combine like going out in nature and mm. birding and doing artwork and so nature journaling is just like it just combined like both of my really combines it well just being out in the field seeing birds and then just doing artwork while like watching and seeing all the details of birds and their habitat and the scenery. I just, I just love that idea of nature journal. And mm-hmm. so. What's, what's, what do you, what are your go-to materials in your field kit? What do you take with you when you're sketching in the field? Um, this is a new medium that I picked up last year. It's called gouache. Mm-hmm. I gouache is like, I just love gouache. I just think like my favorite is gouache and then next is watercolor. And then, well, those are pretty much gouache and watercolor. I pretty much bring on the field. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I just really like how gouache, like when it dries, how it shows up on the paper and how it's very like opaque and just, I just love the colors. And I just really think it's really neat how it's like clay based. And I just, I just love gouache, love gouache. And portable as well. It's, it's easy to throw yes. in your bag and yeah, so mm-hmm. cool. I, I do watercolor, but I'm hearing a lot about gouache and I keep thinking to myself, I need to, I need to do that. <laughs> so you yes. also have an amazing skill as a bird photographer. When did you start photography and how did you develop that skill? Again, was it, did it come before or after birding? Um, this was after birding. Well, I I used to do like some photography with my phone of like just like nature photography of like landscapes, but um, after I started birding, that's when I got like a real like camera, mm-hmm. and I forgot the model, but it wasn't it wasn't like you know like a Nikon or um, it was kind of it was like an older model mm-hmm. of it. So, I mean, the pictures, they were okay. It wasn't, like, the best. Um, But I started off with uh, just a beginner camera for about a year. And then in 2018, that's when I had um, that camera. And then in 2019, for my birthday, my 16th birthday, my parents gifted me with um, a Nikon D3500. And it has um, a 70 to 300 millimeter lens. And so uh, I was able to get some, it was, a, it was an upgrade from mm-hmm. the camera that I had before. So. Um, Did you feel the difference so in that, the photographs you were taking? Did you find that it was producing better quality photos? Yes. The quality was way better. Um, I was able to like 
kind of zoom in more on the bird and I just love the setting. The settings were better as well. And it's it's just it was just a upgrade, totally different oh, upgrade. So fun. I love the way you capture birds in flight as well. I think that's a real skill and such mm-hmm. a wonderful thing. Yes, I I love like capturing birds in motion or like mm. in action, like flying or they're foraging or running or in um it just really like I just love capturing just like the essence and like just their movement. Beautiful. Yeah, their behavior. Yeah, so cool. I'm so you're in Savannah, Georgia, and I'd love for you to describe for the listeners what do you see around you? What does nature look like where you are in Savannah, Georgia? So here in Savannah, we use like this term called the low country. And the low country, it pretty much it's from Charleston, South Carolina, and then all the way through um, South Carolina, like the the coast, like the barrier islands, um, such as like St. Helena Island, Pinckney Island, Hilton Head Island, and then it goes all the way down to here, uh, Savannah, Georgia. And so nature around here, like the low country atmosphere and nature is just like like this kind of like Southern, kind of like semi-tropical, well, I'm talking about like the climate, but mm-hmm. um, <laughs> but um, a main like, like factor of the low country is just like water. Like there's water okay. everywhere pretty much, um, like here on the coast of the Atlantic. And um, there's rivers that flow from the Appalachian mountains, um, such as, uh, the Savannah River, and then we have uh, the Autumn Hall River, and it like it really just shapes our coast and creates um, all these different features. Like we have marshes and barrier islands, and um, there's sounds and tidal sandbars, and like habitats such as like swamps and uh, mm. forest basins and maritime forests. It's just um it's just Sounds incredible like, it's very like there's so many like diverse habitats here because of water and mm. um so it's just really good like atmosphere and uh environment here in the low country it's just really good it's really great for birding yeah um, we have like 250 plus species that call the low country home or migrate through the low country Wow. And um what some amazing. like the Yeah, some famous like birds are like the egrets, mm-hmm. especially like great egrets, uh great blue heron, like little egrets, and um some people call them like like I know my grandma, she calls them cranes and mm-hmm. um like different nicknames for them. It's just, just an amazing place for birding and wildlife as well. Like we have bondos, dolphins, the American alligator, which are very oh. abundant, um, <laughs> like pretty much in almost in every pond or lagoon or marsh, like there's there's alligators, like there's for millions. Real? Oh yes. gosh. Do you have wow. to be careful? Are they dangerous? Um, they can be, um, especially when they get like huge, like 15 feet. And <laughs> um, I know on Hilton Head Island, um, which is off the coast of South Carolina, uh, there was a lady with her dog who got attacked by an alligator. Um, they were walking <sighs> too close to the edge and she um, actually died. So, oh, gosh. Um, so yeah, there's been rec- there's been many reports of, alligators like killing people which is it's very um so you have to have your wits about you when you're burning yes yeah Mm -hmm. so always like especially on the edge of water you know you got to be careful because they'll just they're they're very like they camouflage like with their like dark green and like brown back like they can just jump out and yeah 
Oh, so, that sounds – here in Australia, yeah. up north, we have um, saltwater crocodiles and they can be super dangerous mm. too. And they, you'll see like signs up saying, don't swim here. But mm. the crocodiles are apparently really good at remembering habits. So they they watch and they wait and they see, are you coming back the next day at this time? And oh, ooh, give uh, me the shivers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you are also a birding guy. Tell me about Ike's birding hikes and what happens on one of your trips. Yeah, so Ike's birding hikes, um, I the original thought, it actually came from um, this project. It's called District Project Achievement and for this organization called 4-H. And it's a, a youth leadership organization. And so... Um, for the project, I wanted to talk about a bird called the American White Ibis, which is another uh, like shorebird uh, here that's very common in Savannah. And so I thought, I was like, what if I make it like a skit and pretend like I'm on a bird watching hike and I'm talking to my audiences, the <laughs> like people that are with me on the hike and birders and um, so yeah, I just, something does some, I just developed that, incorporate that in my project. And then I then thought about, well, what if I actually like bring this idea of like doing, uh, hikes, like bring it to life, bring Ike's burning hikes to life. Yeah. And then, so I just, just got motivated to do that. And I coordinated with. Uh, some teachers at my high school who um, they're like not owners, but they're like supervisors of mm -hmm. um, a farm in our county called Hunter Ridge Plantation. And uh, it's they have, it's like acres of large oak tree forest and they have this wide open fields. And I've, I've been like birding there and it's, I, it's really good birding. Um, especially like in the summertime. And so I just connected with a game and I was like, hey, I would like to lead a bird watching hike here. And so, you know, we put that together and I actually create my own field guides for oh, each fantastic. of the hikes I do. And um, I illustrate like 20 birds that that are commonly seen or you could see while we're on our hike, just to give like a visual representation or like um, something like for them to just keep them engaged with the hike. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was in the summer of 2018 was when that launched at on Hunter Ridge Plantation. And we had a good group of people come out. It was like 15 uh, individuals That's and great. we had a great time and so I just I kept doing them I I did a Christmas theme one and then I did an owl hike at the same location at Honey Ridge and uh, that was really fun we heard uh, great horn owls and some barred owls as well and we we're looking for other nocturnal wildlife mm. But yeah, so I just, that was something that I uh, started and I, I I look forward to doing one like in the summer, like in the spring of this year. I haven't done one in a while due to uh, COVID Yeah, and I was just really kind of busy in school and everything. So yes, so. Oh, I'm so impressed. That's awesome. Yeah, I can just see you having an amazing future in in that area so so impressive yeah so you are also on a mission to get rid of honorific bird names and i'd love for you to talk about the movement bird names for birds and what's behind it and the work you're doing with your friend george perry to further this movement yes yeah, so i i connected with uh george uh through instagram mm -hmm. and i think it was last year and I just thought he was a cool person, a cool dude to connect with, because I'd never seen like another young black male birder 
Um, and so decided to reach out to him and uh, be friends with him. And I remember we started talking and he was telling me about like the feminist bird club and uh, bird names for birds and how they were like planning to get rid of honorific names. And so I just had the idea. I was like, hey, what if we could, you know, start doing this ourselves and started creating some names to rename uh, honorific birds? So and just for so, so just for a little bit of background, so a lot of the prominent historical figures in birding and natural history, they're not people that we should be honoring in this way because the, uh, by using these names, we're continually referencing like a historical a history of racism and distressing colonial heritage. Um, so so some birds have a name attached to them to um, honor someone in history. So this is what we mean when we say honorific bird names, just to explain the history. Yes, yes. And um, I just I just also think like just in general of like putting a human name on a bird or, mm. or organism, it's just, it's kind of like, it's kind of, it's just kind of like selfish and cause you're not naming the organism or animal for uh you know a prominent you know something that describes it or describes mm -hmm. its natural beauty or mm -hmm. behavior or just not highlighting the significance of of the organism so mm -mm. yes yeah so yeah so you and george have been doing this amazing thing on instagram where you will rename a bird and then you'll put out a survey and people can click to choose this name or that name it's so fun can you talk about that yes. a little bit <laughs> yeah so that was actually george's idea and it was we were debating over one of the the birds it was harris's hawk and so my name that i wanted to do was the red wolf hawk mm -hmm. and then his name was wolf just wolf hawk and okay. so um <laughs> we were just like debating i was like well my name it like describes it uh, describes this red color and it could bring awareness to the red wolf species and then he was just saying well wolf hawk it just sounds better just as wolf hawk <laughs> and so we just came to agreement it was like well, what if we make a poll and ask people what do they think? And then so, uh, and then after that, it was like, well, like after results, yeah, um, just there were, we had so many people participating. It was like, you know what, George, I think we should like this keep doing something. these and like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, this is something that can like really just start a conversation in our community and. Uh, just to have other people's opinions on like what the name should be. So yeah, we just started doing them. I think we did about like 30 of them so far. Yeah, and it's so fun to watch. I think it's watch. more than 30, but you know, yes. <laughs> That's awesome. And so do you take on a name? Like, so, so if, um, I see, I don't know North American birds because I'm down here in Australia, but um mm -hmm. If, if you have a bird that has an honorific name, do you just personally rename it? Do you know what I mean? Like, oh. do you, if, if you see a such and such, do you in your mind change it and, and name it something else? Yes. Like, if I'm out in the field and I see yep. a bird that has an honorific name, then I would call it something else. Like, yeah, for instance, yeah. I remember last week I visited Charleston and uh, well, specifically, I was on Kiowa Island and on Kiowa Island Beach, and I was doing some nature journaling and I kept seeing Forster's turn <laughs> and um, I, I called the Marsh turns. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so like, I just like, yeah, like how you're saying, I just like personally changed the names yeah. to a name that I think that suits them best. And um, what you can also do, like, to, like, kind of, like, physically, like, in your own way, physically change them, is going in your field guide and just, like, marking out the yeah. 
the honorific name and then writing it like on top or like to the side or or maybe like get a piece of paper and, and put the like your new name that you want to call it and tape it over the honorific name. Yeah. And that's yep. just like just kind of like making a statement. Yeah, just making a statement and just really yep. like just physically changing in your own way. So. Yeah, and I mean, language is fluid. Words in in all languages are developing and changing all the time. You know, they have those things where the dictionary will cha- will say, okay, now this is officially a word because people have been using it, you know, not just mm. for bird names but for just language in general. But also that's how bird – that's how names develop. It's just whenever it's being used. And so if we just keep – doing this and just keep using it you know you say you you change the name of the turn and then you just keep using it and you're telling people about it that's how things that's how changes happen yes like it could definitely like just cause like a chain of like yeah um just like going out and like if if you're maybe like in a group of with birders and then going out and saying like oh i call them instead of forces turn i call them the march turn yeah. And then maybe that could carry on to the birders and then exactly. that could, you know, spread if they connect with other birders and Exactly. Um so yeah, just I could definitely um, you know, how you're saying the language of doing that could definitely make a change. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's what that's I awesome. really hope to see. Um It's a really good mission. So, yes. Yeah. So cool. So you've been named the 2021 Eckleberry Fellow. And so firstly, I just want to say congratulations. This is wonderful. Thank you. And so to um, give some background about it, the Eckleberry Fellowship is an endowment to encourage artists with a focus on nature to develop their craft and create an educational or conservation-oriented project. And so... Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to talk about your project, which is going to involve researching the history of birds and people in the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. I'd love to hear all about it. Yes. So I'm conducting research on pretty much the African history between Barbados, Charleston, South Carolina, and the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, which is on the coast of South Carolina, Georgia, and Northern Florida. And with that, I will, I have a desire to, uh, just to see how enslaved Africans or um, Africans in these areas connected with birds uh, of the areas and the nature and the wildlife and how, you know, birds were affected by the cultivation of Africans and uh, plantations like rice fields and uh, cotton fields. And I also want to see like uh, what birds did enslaved Africans see or encounter, you know, because they were, you know, out in plantations so every day working yes. and cultivating uh, crops. And so, you know, they had to, you know, encounter and, see the nature of these areas and i know for one example the bobolink uh which is a black bird uh that migrates through like the southeast it's been called the rice bird because they've been uh uh feasting on in rice plantations and on the rice um as they migrate and so a method that enslaved Africans had to do or like use was to to go around and like be watch out for bobolinks and other birds such as like sparrows and crows and grackles and they would have to make like loud banging noises or just create like um just loud noises to scare them away in order to to protect the rice and Currently, right now, I'm doing a lot of research on African history in South Carolina and African history in the Southeast in general. And then I'll be looking into Barbados. Um, Mm. And a lot of enslaved Africans were brought over from Barbados to Charleston. That's what 
uh, I'm currently looking at. And then, oh, also my book, well, with this research that I'm doing, I'm planning to illustrate or publish a book. Fantastic. And it will be like a field guide slash cultural guide. Wow. And um, yes, it is. No, oh, that research sounds absolutely amazing. So important, such important work. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, I'm wondering what sort of documents are you accessing for your research like what records were kept and what sort of documents you're looking at for the research or do you or is it um are you contacting people who know about this stuff through their oral traditions um i've just been collecting books um mm -hmm. one that i'm reading up is pretty much like a synopsis of african history in south carolina Mm -hmm. um, but I will be going to different places to look for more resources. Mm -hmm. um, I know Hilton Head Island Library. I think they have they would have a lot of good resources for the cultural history in that area. Um, I know Clemson University. Um, and, that's, and there's a lot of um, universities. Uh, that can go to yes. for resources and for mm. scholarly scholarly articles. And so, but yes, I'll be definitely, I'm like in the process of gathering yeah. um, some resources yeah. for my books. And your research might take you to Barbados. Do you think you'll make a trip there or will it be remote? Um. Yes, I, I am looking to going to Barbados. Um, I could potentially go this year um, before I head to Cornell, but I'll just have to see because I think uh, I might like I think to get over there, I have to get the vaccine. Yes. And, um, but I'll see like just how everything works out. But if not this year, then maybe sometime next year's or two years from now, I'll be yeah. able to go to Barbados and do research on the island as well. So. Oh, such valuable work. I, I just am so impressed. And the idea to have a field guide of birds that had an interaction with enslaved people and the cultural importance of that is such deep and important stuff that you're doing. So congratulations on that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm interested in your personal connection with this. Can you talk about your personal cultural history? Yeah, so um, my heritage, I have uh, Gullah roots, and I believe my grandma's grandmother, she was enslaved. And um, so, you know, along with doing this project, uh, is really just uh, trying to rediscover about a culture that I'm connected to and just to learn um, about my history, my heritage, and to share with others about it and also how it's been uh, diminishing over time and disappearing. And just I have a hope of bringing awareness to the Gullah Geechee culture and what others can do in order to, to help and protect it. Yeah. That's so valuable. Thank you, Isaiah, for yeah. sharing that. So you've achieved so much and you're still so young. You're still a high school senior. You're about to graduate. I would love to know what's next for you. What are your plans? Do you want to make birding your career? What What's next for you? Um, what's next for me is college. And mm -hmm. I've been accepted to Cornell University. Fantastic. Um, so... I'll be heading up there in July, well, in June, uh, pretty much this summer, I'll be there for a pre-freshman program that they're doing in preparation for, before I get in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, for the fall. And um, I'm actually majoring in environment and sustainability. Great. And i really be looking forward to being in the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and doing some bird studies there. So, yes, really That's looking forward wonderful. to it. <laughs> uh, it's been such a joy to talk to you. Your passion is just 
so huge and it's wonderful to to learn more about it your history and the background so thank you so much yes thank you so much for having me it was a pleasure just talking about my whole journey and um thank you so much thank you I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I'm always in awe of young people like Isaiah who don't find youth to be any hindrance in just standing up and creating change in this world. They're not waiting for change to happen, they're making it happen. I love that it was the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that sparked Isaiah's initial interest in birding and now he's headed back there to begin his own university studies. A huge congratulations to Isaiah for all that he's achieved already please take a look at the show notes to find links to Isaiah's work and be sure to follow him on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week.